Greetings, welcome to our online service from Grace Point. This is our last message in our Easter series entitled, Why? In this message, we're going to look at the question, why should I surrender my life to Jesus Christ? It's evident that Jesus was a totally surrendered person to God. God the Son was in total submission to God the Father. He willingly chose the nails. He prayed that prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, but thy will be done. This prayer of Jesus, this prayer of God the Son to God the Father, relates to us this incredibly important principle I call it the power of the surrendered life. This idea of having a surrendered life goes way beyond just being born again, which is incredibly important. It goes beyond being obedient. It goes to this idea that we understand that we do the best in our life when we're most surrendered to our God. In this particular message, I'm going to give you the big thought right away, the principle And then I'm going to expand on that principle a little bit as the message unfolds. So our principle today is this. You are most victorious when you are most surrendered to God. I'm going to say that again. You are most victorious when you're most surrendered to God. Years ago at Grace Point, we did a series of messages from the Sermon on the Mount, the first major teaching of Jesus Christ. And we zoomed in on some of the first things that Jesus said, uh, these things called the Beatitudes, and we did a, a series from that portion of the Sermon on the Mount. And one of these Beatitudes really applies to this principle I just shared with you. It's the Beatitude found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, which says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. I want you to read that with me at home. If you have kids there present too, have them join in. Let's say that verse together. Let's say Matthew chapter 5, verse 5 together. Here we go. Join me. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, meekness is not weakness. It's really different from weakness. It means this, my strength under God's control. My strength under God's control. It's about surrender. It's about submission. And it's a willing surrender. It's not a forced surrender. I don't know how many of you men and how many of you boys had some friends when you were young that used to wrestle a lot. I had several that fell into that category. And frequently they would wrestle. And I didn't participate in this. I never liked that. It's too close for me. I don't like that kind of closeness with another male human being. But at any rate, they would wrestle until one would get hopelessly pinned and he couldn't move. And the one who was on top would say, what are the words? And the one who was pinned would have to say, you know, I yield, I give, you're stronger than me, uh, uh, and I'm weaker than you, or whatever the words were that they decided they needed to use at that time. Um, Listen, our surrender to God is not that sort of forced thing. It's to be this willing surrender with no kind of force of having to do it. You are most victorious when you are most surrendered to God. Jesus describes himself as being meek. Meekness goes against our popular views of heroes. Normally a hero like Superman or Spider-Man. Mostly those kind of heroes are heroes because they have some kind of superpower. They're super strong. Um, And if your kids are with you right now watching this message, you could take a break right now with them. They're probably getting anxious already anyway, especially if they're smaller. And you can ask them, what is your favorite superhero? And as you do so, listen partly to what I'm saying, and talk with them also. I'm going to continue on. When I was young, my favorite comic hero was The Flash. I thought, I I just like him because he's so fast. I want to be fast like that. But when we talk about superheroes, it doesn't have to be restricted to some kind of comic book uh, personality. Think about a hero from the Bible, maybe someone there that really strikes you. I know I have a couple 
biblical heroes that I frequently think of when someone says, who in the Bible is like a hero to you? Well, one is Esther for me because she was so courageous in, in the middle of, uh, of this very, you know, kind of tough situation where she's in submission to this ungodly king. She stands for the things of God and stands up for her people. It was just such a courageous act. Another one that's my hero from the Bible is Nehemiah. And I love him because he was more of a political figure and he took this uh, this rebuilding of Jerusalem wall so seriously. And we can see from the example of Nehemiah that you don't necessarily have to be a, a, a prophet or a pastor or an evangelist or somebody like that to be a biblical hero. You can be a biblical hero and do a job like he did, be, being a governor, so to speak. And I, I really found that fascinating. Um, I tell you what, some heroes in my life have been some of my relatives. I, I recently got to attend a couple of funerals of my uncles, Uncle Jim and Uncle Don, who passed away. And when I look at them and what they were in my life, I would say, yeah, they were really good men, and they were really influential in a good way in my life. Um, I know personally, I'm kind of a little bit of a nerd. I like the science side of life, and a couple of my uh, heroes are Isaac Newton. I think this guy's phenomenal. He discovered calculus. And then you have Robert Boyle who discovered the ideal gas law. These guys were geniuses. And from their work, so much of our technology now has really found its foundation. And when, you, when we look at our heroes in our culture, we think winner. They did something outstanding. They had some kind of great accomplishment. Winning is so valued in our culture. We want to win over COVID-19. We don't want to just have a, a treaty with it. We want to be more than a conqueror over this kind of a thing. We want our particular sports team to win their sporting event. But get this. When it comes to the kingdom of God, winning is utterly redefined. Let me give you a kingdom definition of winning. A kingdom of God definition of winning. It's staying submitted or staying surrendered to the Lord no matter what you are experiencing. That is the definition of winning when it comes to following God. Staying submitted, staying surrendered no matter what you are experiencing. At times, it's going to take all that you have, all the strength that you have, every ounce of your strength to stay submitted to God. See, meekness is not weakness. It's my strength under the control of God. And Jesus invites his followers to surrender. If you were to go to Matthew chapter 11, here's what Jesus says in verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So when Jesus gives this invitation, he starts by saying, take my yoke upon you. What he means by this is that we're to submit to him every day in every way. A yoke that he was referring to was an implement that tied two oxen together. And it was made in such a way that it would distribute the, the weight upon the shoulders and the neck of these animals so that it would prevent pain and discomfort as they used that yoke to pull a plow or whatever implement they were pulling. In ancient culture, the yoke was a term that was used to describe submission. So when someone was described as being yoked to someone or something, it was communicating the idea that he or she was in submission to that person or that thing. <clears throat> so to be yoked to Jesus means to serve and obey him. Now, before you dismiss this too much and think, well, that's a great idea, but I don't know if that's really where I'm at, consider this. Consider this. Everyone is yoked to something. The question is, to whom or to what will you be yoked? Some are yoked to sin and the power of sin, and that's a terrible taskmaster. Some are yoked into a relationship that's harmful, 
There's codependency and dysfunctionality. Jesus invites us, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. There is a comfort in being yoked to something or someone who is a benevolent entity. We're going to learn the ways of living from somewhere, from someone. Being on your own can be intimidating. It can be overwhelming. It can be just plain scary. One of the big challenges of this COVID-19 quarantine is this feeling of isolation and loneliness, especially for those maybe who don't have a good support group anyway, or perhaps are single, or whatever be the case. But get this, in Jesus, we're invited into the situation of never being alone. He's offering us an opportunity to learn from him, an opportunity to serve a righteous purpose, making our lives so meaningful. Now consider the image that Jesus is trying to portray here in this invitation to be yoked to him. Two oxen were chosen to be yoked together. One typically would be an older oxen who was trained and hardy from years of routine. The second typically would be a younger oxen. This one had potential but was very inexperienced. By sharing the yoke with a veteran ox, the younger was trained by the elder. Not only that, but the more experienced ox would draw harder on the yoke, would do the majority of the work, of the pushing. Since the older one led, the younger ox didn't have to wonder what to do. He just had to follow. And as he learned and gained knowledge from this being yoked to the older, more experienced one, hopefully the thought was that someday this younger one could become the one that would train another one. Jesus invites us to learn of him to be yoked with him. It's another way of saying, be my disciple. There's peace in not having to figure out life on your own. There's assurance as we follow his lead that we're going the right direction. And get this, when you yoke up with Jesus, it fits you perfectly and he carries the majority of the load. That's how we find rest, by yoking up with him. Understand something really important here. Surrender like I'm talking about in this message begins with giving your life in true authenticity to Jesus Christ. Now, if you've never done this, I encourage you to do so now. Experiences like we're going through right now, this COVID-19, this quarantine, all this anxiety, all this upheaval, all this economic kind of thing that we're going through, are often the tools to get a hold of hearts to reveal that there's a deep need of something more. Perhaps you're one watching today where you're saying, yeah, that's me. I need something more. Well, the more you need is Jesus Christ. Ask him to come into your heart if you've never done that. Ask him to be your savior if you've never done that. Admit he's real and I really do need him. And then ask him to fill you with the person of the Holy Spirit. Then once that is accomplished, once we've done that, then what we're supposed to understand is what I'm talking about in this message. That we are most victorious in our lives when we are most surrendered to Jesus Christ. So this answers our question of this message. Why should I surrender to Jesus? Because you're most victorious when you're most surrendered. Now what I want to do is spend just a few moments explaining to you what does this surrender look like? How do I actually do it? So I'm going to take you back to hours before Jesus' death. and We're going to return once again to the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where we were last week. And we're going to learn from Jesus as he models for us what it truly means to be a surrendered follower of God. So last week in our message, we looked at the prayer of Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. In this message, we're picking up right from there, right where we left off last week. I'm going to read to you Matthew chapter 26, verses 45 through 56. 
Hear these words. Let them go into your heart. In fact, bow your head right now. I'm going to pray that even at your home, God anoints the reading of this word to the blessing of your soul. So just bow your head real quickly with me. Lord God, I want to pray now as I read these words from your scripture that they would penetrate our heart, that they reveal insight to us about what it means to be a surrendered follower of Jesus Christ. In your holy name, God, amen. Here we go, beginning with verse 45. Then he, Jesus, returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus replied, Do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this is all taking place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. In these last hours, Jesus modeled for us what the surrendered life looks like. And I want to point out some of the highlights, some of the takeaways of this modeling as we finish this message. First is this. Jesus willingly went. Did you hear that? Jesus willingly went. The crowd thought they were in control. They had clubs and swords. But honestly, Jesus willingly went with them. He chose the path. He knew what lie ahead of him. He had had that Gethsemane moment. He had prayed through this, and he was now ready to and determined to follow the will of God. And he knew that what lie ahead of him was pain and suffering and crucifixion. Now it gets real. Now he has to do it. And he willingly went. Surrender that is rooted in meekness will willingly do the Father's will. A dad noted this about his son. He said, my three-year-old son loved the outdoor so much that he would not take the time to get dressed before entering it. In the city, the father said, this can be quite a bit of embarrassment. I don't know about you watching, but I know in our household, when our kids were little, none of them seemed to want to wear clothes. And we had to constantly work with them on wearing uh, clothes. So I'm relating to what this father is sharing. One morning, the mother caught the little boy outside playing in his underwear. She called to him through the window room, uh, living room window. Why are you running around outside in your underwear? Innocently, the little boy replied back, I'm not, Mom. I'm walking. The little boy was going to this age-old kind of technicality angle. I'm not really disobeying because I'm walking here. Receive this truth. The surrendered life in Jesus is a life that is willing. It isn't looking for any way out. It isn't looking for some rationalization or justification of why it shouldn't. It's fixated on doing the will of God. Is that you? Is that how you are when it comes to your relationship with Christ? Are you just fixated on doing what is right? And are you willing 
to follow him. Ask God to grace you to have this kind of attitude. One who is willing to do the will of the Father. Let me ask you a question. How does it make you feel when you ask somebody to do something and you get this? The old eye roll. It makes you feel like, wow, they're not respecting me. They don't really, they're not taking what I'm asking them seriously right now. And I think sometimes unintentionally beloved, we do the eye roll with God. We think, well, I'm not going to do that. I don't see why I need to do that. But if we're going to truly be surrendered and really understand the concept I'm trying to share with you in this message, you have to be willingly willing to do the Father's will. Second takeaway is this. Jesus refused to use the resources that were rightly his to save himself. His near future loomed with the crucifixion. He knew there was suffering that he was about to engage in. I, I, there, was, there had to be tension. We know there was tension in his soul because of the prayer that we looked at last week in the Garden of Gethsemane that he wrestled with God about doing this uh, tough thing. I, I want you to kind of experience a little bit of that tension today. Maybe enter into that feeling just a moment here uh, in this message. What did it feel like for you the hour before you had to do a speech in high school? I remember I used to dread that moment. I used to think, oh man, you know, I'm just going to look like a fool here when I do this and I don't want to do this. It's the last thing I want to do. I remember the butterflies you'd get sometimes before a big basketball game as you're sitting in the locker room. You're going, oh, and you're feeling the tension of all that uh, and in the moment of it all. Um, I, I, I don't know if you've had this feeling, but I, I remember uh, the night before a big test, especially when I was in college, that perhaps you had studied for for months and you're wondering, have I studied enough? Do I know what's going on? And you had kind of those butterflies. Or how about this? For those of you that are, are, are presenting at work, at times you have to give a big project proposal to somebody in, in your workplace and you feel that feeling of, wow, deep in the pit of your stomach, I hope this goes well. Well, Jesus was feeling all that and tremendously more. He could have fled. He could have just run. Or as we just read about here in the scriptures, uh, in this message, he could have called 12 legions of angels to rescue him. A legion was 6,000. So Jesus was saying, I have at my disposal 72,000 angels. Do you see the ridiculousness of this whole situation? I mean, Jesus, sure, he was feeling the angst of it all. He could have fled. He could have easily called on these angels and gotten out of it. Instead, he followed God's plan. And, and, and I look at the, when I'm I, when I saying, do you see the ridiculous of this situation? Uh, do you see how silly it was that this crowd came to Jesus with clubs and swords and thought they were in control? I mean, they really had the might of an ant or a gnat or something. They had no real power. They had no idea what they were really facing off here. Jesus demonstrated the meekness, though, in the middle of all this. He had all these resources, but he did not say, I have a right to use these resources to get out of this. Instead, he put his strength under God's control, under God's plan. He chose the nails. He chose the will of God. He refused any other course of action. When you surrender to God, friends, it's not about you anymore. It's all about what God wants to accomplish. It's all about what he wants to do. How are you doing with that? Are you understanding surrender that way? The irony is that this kind of surrender to God is such a powerful place to be in life. Third thing, Jesus understood the power of following God's purpose. He understood all that was taking place. His arrest, his crucifixion was part of God's plan. Now, in Jesus' case, it was not God's plan for him to win that skirmish with the crowd at Gethsemane. God's purpose was much greater for Jesus. It was to win the war with Satan. It was to crush the adversary's head. It was to be crucified so that he could set captives free from sin and death. So much of our energy can be wasted on skirmishes that don't matter. A businessman harassed and discouraged from overwork, took his problems to a counselor who promptly told him, do less work. 
Furthermore, the counselor advised him, spend an hour a week in a cemetery. And the businessman was puzzled by that. Why should I spend an hour a week in the cemetery? What am I supposed to do in the cemetery? To which the counselor replied, not much. Take it easy. Look around. Get acquainted with some of the people there and realize they didn't finish their work either. Nobody does, you know. And the counselor was really encouraging this businessman, slow down, see beyond the skirmishes of your life, see beyond the busyness of your life, and begin to realize what truly matters. There's all kinds of debate going on right now about this COVID-19 thing. And I know it's drastically affecting so many of our lives. It can affect us from actually having the disease. It can affect us from all this, uh, you know, quarantining and isolation. It can affect you financially. Um, But if you just look at this whole thing from this kind of skirmish level and never drill into it much deeper than that, it's not the redemptive tool it could be in your life. Ask yourself some questions like this. Am I finding peace with God in the middle of all this? Am I truly finding peace with you, God? Can I have peace with you in spite of unfavorable circumstances around me? Second, ask this kind of question. Am I able to patiently endure God while this thing tends to unfold itself, not being able to control the outcome? Can I patiently wait in you, Lord? I like to say this. Faith isn't faith until it has to be put into practice. Perseverance or patience isn't patience until you have to persevere through some things. COVID-19 is allowing us to be people who say, my faith will prevail and I'll persevere through this thing with the help of God. Here's another question you could ask. Am I pursuing the right priorities in my life? Have I been living such a busy, out of control life, so distracted that I have not had time to sit and contemplate in the cemetery that one day my life will end? Am I living for the right things? I see all this robust debate going on concerning COVID-19. What's essential services? What's safe practices? When is quarantine long enough? When is it not long enough? When will a vaccine be available? When will the, you know, hydroxychloroquine trial take place in South Dakota? Will it work? All that kind of thing. These are important issues, friends. But listen, they're skirmishes. As important as they are, they're skirmishes. God wants to drill down into our hearts so that we experience true transformation, so that we come out of this experience determined to be ones who understand the power of pursuing God's purposes for our life. I'm going to finish up this message by going back again to Matthew chapter, or excuse me, to John chapter 26 and read the exchange that took place there. I'm going to actually pick up our reading in verse 62. Up to this point, there's just a lot of accusations being thrown out at Jesus. So listen to what is said here, beginning with verse 62. Uh, of Matthew uh, chapter, um, John chapter 26. I blew it again, but John chapter 26. Here we go. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Lots of drama is happening in in the life of Jesus now. And drama can be a great distraction for you as a follower of God. Would you agree there's lots of drama happening right now in our culture? And drama can easily distract us and get us really caught up in skirmishes. Get this last point. It's incredibly important if you're going to be surrendered to God. Jesus saw through the dilemma of the moment And he focused on his destiny. He's brought before the high priest. He's brought before the chief priests in the Sanhedrin. And they want to put him to death. And all kinds of false accusations is flying his way. It's chaotic. It's a mess. He doesn't even address that. In the midst of that dilemma, we see him just saying, I know where I'm going. I'm going to be at the right hand of the mighty one. He knew his destiny And the dilemma was really loud and it was really distracting, but it didn't take us focused off his destiny. He's going to the Father's right hand. This understanding of destiny is so vital for us for staying surrendered to God. You must have that awareness and know your destiny. When 84 years old, the late Supreme Court Justice Wendell Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes, was on a train. And when the conductor came to get his ticket, Holmes 
could not find his train ticket. He searched his pockets, he searched his wallet, and he seemed very distressed. The conductor was sympathetic and, and, and said, don't worry, Mr. Holmes, the Pennsylvania Railroad will be happy to trust you. After you reach your destination, you'll probably find your ticket. Just mail it back to us then. Everything is fine. But this kindness failed to put Holmes at ease. Holmes, still very upset, replied, my dear man, my problem is not where is my ticket. My problem is where am I going? He couldn't remember where he was going. Jesus knew where he was going. So he could look through the dilemma of the moment and focus on his destiny. If you know your destiny, friends, is heaven, if you receive Christ and you know your destiny is heaven, then that will keep all things we're going through now in the proper perspective. And we'll be able to look through the dilemmas, look through all the distractions, all the drama that's going on now, and we're going to have this surrender to Christ that's truly victorious. I love how our Matthew 26 reading ended in verse 64. Jesus just simply proclaimed his position. In reply to the question, was he Messiah? He said, you said so. Earlier on, down in Matthew chapter 27, verse 11, when Pilate asked him, are you king of the Jews? He said, yes. Jesus was willing to just stand on who he was in God. And that's our conclusion to the message. As a surrendered follower, proclaim your position in Jesus. That's what Jesus did. He knew his position. He was part of the Trinity. He's the Son of God. His position was at the right hand of the Father. Do you know your position in Jesus? I love how 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, succinctly summarizes who we are in Jesus. Read this out loud with me. Read this out loud with me. If you can find your children, I'm sure they're gone by now if they're young especially, gather them up and have them read along with us and take this scripture to heart. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Do you know that you're truly God's possession? If you know this, if you're secure in that position, which you should be if you're a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're going to be able to look through all the dilemma and all the drama of a culture like ours that's so out of control right now, and you're going to still remain surrendered to God, and you're going to be um, one who understands the power of following God's purpose for you. You're not going to get all caught up in the skirmishes that are going on that are unfruitful. Um, you're going to refuse to use the resources of God selfishly. You're going to share them abundantly because you're in surrender to God. And you're going to willingly follow the will of the Father. All this stuff is going to find its place. And especially if you know your position in Christ. Why surrender your life to, to, to Jesus? You are most victorious when you are most surrendered. I want to encourage you, if you want to continue to further study some of this material that I've talked with you about in this message, go to our webpage, go to the media section, find today's bulletin in that media section, and do the Together at Home, Discipling with Family and Friends section. And there's some questions there that will help you to continue on in what we've begun here today. At this moment, we're going to close with prayer. And I want to encourage you. Kneel as I pray. As you participate with me in this moment of prayer, let's do so with this act of surrender, of kneeling. So find a spot by the couch or the chair that you're sitting at. Get down on the floor and kneel. I'm going to do that very thing. And then we're going to close here with a prayer of surrender. Lord God, I want to just say to you that surrender really is a good thing. We are most victorious when we are most surrendered to you, Jesus. And as I, I noted before in the message, this truly begins, this whole process of surrender, when we give our hearts to you, Jesus, and really mean it. So I want to pray for anyone uh, watching that if they've never given their heart to you, Jesus, that today would be that day. This moment would be that moment that they would say, Jesus, I'm yours. I'm giving you my heart. I'm declaring you're my king and my savior, and I'm going to follow you. And Lord, I pray that one that's praying such a prayer that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit and that they would become this follower who's born again in you. And God, I want to pray for all of us who know you, uh, whether it's just brand new or for 50 years, that we would understand the power of the surrendered life and that we'd willingly be surrendered to you in thought, word, and deed, in actions, in, in, in what we pursue, Lord, that all these areas of our lives would be in submission to you, Lord, and that we would understand the power 
and uh, that kind of, of, of a submitted life, Lord. And I just pray that all the things that we're going through right now culturally, whether it be COVID-19, uh, actually having the disease, whether it be um, laid off or furloughed, whether it be um, having our small business shut down, Lord, for uh, you know, social distancing purposes, whether it be that we're just frustrated with the social distancing in general, Lord. I just pray that in all these things that we would be people who are surrendered to you, God, and coming out the other side of this thing, knowing you better and following you harder, Lord, and being transformed body, soul, and spirit as we do so. So come, Holy Spirit, anoint each household that's watching. Fill each person with, with uh, the knowledge of yourself, Jesus. And may we live and move and truly have our being in you, God. I pray all these things in your most holy name, Jesus. And I'm so thankful for how you model surrender in the most difficult of circumstances right before you face the cross, Lord. And that makes it even doubly impacting. We love you, Jesus, and we praise your holy name. Amen.